Okay. Um, well, first of all, I, uh, I'm guessing you're probably going to see them today for all your classes. So midterm grades are in for like your early warning stuff. Um, as I said, the class did pretty well on the midterm exam as a whole. Um, but some of you have missed like half the assignments or more. So do your homework or you're just going to fail the class is the punchline. So, you know, you'll have a midterm grade that indicates where you are in the class. You can go and look up in the, um, the weighted total in the class. But, you know, homework is 60% of your grade in here. So do it, especially when you consider things like Bible homework and book homework where you have to write a couple of paragraphs. These are like free assignments. So getting zeros on those or returning those in late is, I don't know, just lazy <laughs> is what it comes down to. But, you know, there's your there's your in-class warning, but I'm sure you'll uh, get stuff from your advisors and stuff like that if you had a, um, a low grade. All right, so let's look at the homework assignment. So we were supposed to have a single player play a hand of blackjack, just kind of go through the motions. All right, and then today we're going to start looking at, um, well, we're actually going to look at dictionaries, start looking at dictionaries today. And then we might swing back in, but we'll, we will uh, see, let me get my file open. Open in new window and recover state. Try that? No? Good enough. All right, so this is our current uh, application where we're just showing the value of our hand, blah, blah, blah. So we proved last week that our, or last class, that our value of blackjack hand is working and showing us the current. Um, best value. Now, what it doesn't necessarily uh, tell us is the potential um, value of it, because sometimes you might have a hand with a uh, ace in it that the best value for it is a 20, for example. But if you get another card, the best value now might be a lot less than that because you decide to take a one for that ace instead of an 11. So not really important for this homework assignment, but just something to kind of keep in mind as you're deciding whether to um, hit or stay and, and that kind of stuff. All right, so I'm going to gut most of this. And we're going to start with a, we have a deck of cards. We're going to shuffle that deck, and then we'll go ahead and deal a hand. And now we're going to show the user that hand and then ask them what they want to do. Do they want to uh, um, keep the current, or do they want to stay where they're at, or do they want to uh, um, do something else? So at this point, I want to show you a um, another kind of loop that we haven't necessarily worked with. So I'm pretty sure the book introduces it. Introduce do while loops. Oh, do they really not do do while loops in there? <coughs> oh, they force you to break it so Python doesn't have a do while loop built in. That's kind of stupid. Well, I'll show you this version then. All right, so let's look at the problem first. So we, um, we're going to deal a, a, a hand. Then we're going to show them the value of the hand. So let's just kind of do that. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to say uh, print. What's the name of our function? Get value of blackjack hand. And we'll pass it that hand. 
So that's going to show us the value of the hand. So if we go ahead and run this real quick, we'll see that we have a single hand, and that's showing us the value. So there's the value of our single hand. Now, we might also be interested in seeing the hand, possibly. So let's kind of do um, both things. So let's print out. We'll print out hand one. So that shows us what our hand looks like. And right now we are printing out the value. We don't have to show the value each time through. In fact, that might be better now since we're making a guess at what the, the best value for that hand is. Because as a human being, we might decide whether we want to try our luck with one more card if we have an ace. All right. So now we want to ask the question, do you want to hit or stay? So we're reading something in from the, uh, um, the user. So we'll... Go ahead and print out our hand. Then we're going to ask a question. We're going to say, we'll say choice is equal to input hit or stay. Something like that. All right. So we're just asking them. We're prompting them to read some stuff in. Uh, we'll read it into choice. And then we're going to say if choice is equal to hit that's what they typed in. And right now we're being case sensitive. So we're, we asked them to type in hit with a capital H or an S or a stay with a capital S. So we need to test it against that. So if they chose to hit, we're going to go ahead and we're going to add a card to our blackjack hand. Now, do we have the ability to do that? We have a, so we have something called deal a blackjack hand, which deals us two cards, but we also have something called deal a card, right? So if we chose to hit, we're going to go ahead and say hand one dot append, deal a card, and we pass it the deck. Ay, ay, ay. All right, like that. So we give the deck to the deal card method, deal card function, this guy here. He takes a deck and as a parameter, and he gives you a card off that deck. And what are we doing with that card? We are appending it to our hand. All right. After we do that, we're going to go ahead and print the hand again. Okay, so we're just doing a kind of a single pass. We don't have it inside of a loop yet. We're just kind of showing the, the pieces of the puzzle that we're going to need, right? Else, that means they chose stay. They didn't say hit, they chose stay. So what are we going to do? We're going to go ahead and we're going to print out. Final value of their hand, which is this get value of blackjack hand. Passing it hand one. And we're done. Okay, now we really want to possibly give them the option to do this stuff over and over and over again, right? But let's just test a couple of mechanics here and make sure it does what we expect it to do initially. So we'll save this. All right, we have two aces, hit or stay. So if we say stay, it's going to give us the best value for this hand, which should be a 12. So... We'll go ahead and do that once. We'll say stay gives us our 12. That's our best value. But it only does it once. Oh, this is a good hand. <laughs> okay. But we're going to be stupid <laughs> just because we want to test our hit. Um, so I'm going to type in hit, and it's going to give us another card, and we print out our hand with an extra card in it. All right. Yeah, but we're not doing the logic on that yet, but... It, but right now, we kind of see our mechanics, the different, the different pieces of the puzzle we're going to need to put together to solve this problem. Okay, we have the ability to add some stuff to our hand um, using tools we had already written, and we have the ability to, to show our final, uh, our final answer. All right, so <coughs> now we want to do this over and over and over again 
until we finally get a, well, until they finally say stay or until they bust, right? So we want to have this thing happen a bunch of times. So I guess we have a couple of ways we can handle this. Let's put, let's put this into a loop first. I'm going to introduce the break keyword. Um, I think you've probably seen it in the reading already, uh, but we I haven't talked about it in class. If you use it in the homework, that's fine. Um, but I'm going to show you some alternatives to it. You know, like I don't want to be in here. So, <laughs> so how can you kind of short circuit a loop if you didn't have access to the break keyword? That kind of stuff. All right, so for starters, we're always going to deal a blackjack hand. That always happens, right? So that's not going to be inside of a loop. We deal a blackjack hand, and then I'm just going to start a loop with while true. This is a loop that will go on forever. All right? Now, typically, infinite loops would be bad ideas. All right? But... If we're trying to emulate a do while loop, and let me kind of throw this in the notes real quick just so you have this for other languages. And this has more to do with the nature of Python being an interpreted language, uh, that a do while loop doesn't fit the structure of having that colon and then indentation after it. Um, although they could have done it with a do, but whatever. Um, so we're going to call this three loops. And this is really a most languages thing. There's really more than three, but let's just call it three core loops. And some languages have more, some languages have less. Um, but in general, the two core loops that we're used to are the for and the while loop, right? So these loops are pre-check loops where we ask the Boolean expression before we execute the body of the loop at least one time. So there is no guarantee that we ever get into the body of a for loop or a while loop because we might fail the Boolean expression the first time. Now, a do while loop, this is called a post check loop where we execute the body at least once then ask the question before executing again. Something like that. So we just fast forward into, let's say, next semester just to see what these would look like. Um, Let's just look at like the equivalent of our for loop um, that we've been working with. So we might say for int i is equal to zero, i is less than, you know, maybe we have a string, let's say s dot length, something like that. Um, i is equal to i plus one. Do some stuff. So that's the Java equivalent of kind of our for loops that go through every element of a string. Pretty similar -y, uh, syntax to what we've been dealing with. Okay. Now, if we take this same thing and I show you what a do while loop would have looked like. So we would say do, do some stuff while. You know, I don't know, uh, I is less than s dot length. We'll just throw a random Boolean expression in there. Like that. So this is a do while loop in Java. Now you're not going to have to do these on a test or anything. I'm just kind of showing you uh, other languages. Okay. So a, while, a do while loop in Java ends with a semicolon because that's how all expressions, all statements rather, end in Java. But we don't have a syntax like that in Python. So what I'm getting at here is if we took this exact same slide and we tried to, let's say, guess at what Python uh, would look like. Well, we already know the Python equivalent of this guy, right? 
So this is for i in range of 0 to length of s. That's the equivalent of this guy. And then we don't have the curly braces. Instead, we just operate off indentation. So that's the Python version of that Java for loop. Now, the do while loop, if we were to have this in Python, would probably look like this. Okay. But now you have this question of how do I terminate this while portion of it? How do I terminate this Boolean expression portion? You know, you wouldn't put a semi, or you wouldn't put a colon there, which then indents underneath this because all your stuff is actually above. Does that, that make sense? They would have to kind of, I don't know, hijack the syntax a little bit, maybe do something like a do while i is less than s dot length. And then just have the programmer know that it does not test this the first time. It tests it the second time on or something like that. Um, but they didn't have that. That's fine. But we can build our own. So we can just write a loop that definitely goes in the first time, right? And then if we need to bust out, we can. So that's what we've uh, um, effectively done here. So I'll take that guy out since that's not a thing in our language. So... Here's my loop right here. Here's a while loop, while true, right? So loops keep going as long as the Boolean expression boils down to a, boils down to true. Does true boil down to true? Every day. Yeah. Okay, so we are 100% getting into this loop the first time. So this is a loop that executes at least one time, all right? And then we're gonna have to find a way to escape. <laughs> it's it's the, the punchline. <coughs> so what we'll be doing here, we'll go ahead and print out our hand. We'll ask them if they want to hit or stay. If they chose to hit, we'll go ahead and give them another card. And then let it go ahead and naturally spin back up and print that hand back out. If they chose to stay, we want to get them out of this loop. So this is where that break thing comes in. Break busts us out of the most local loop. All right, so once we're out of that loop, we would have this guy indented underneath the while, so it's not part of the while, it's after the while. So if they said something other than hit, presumably they typed in stay or random stuff, we'll bust them out of the loop, and we will go ahead and um, uh, show the final value of their hand. We could probably show them the hand too. Something like this. All right, so we'll deal a hand. Then we will forever and ever and ever print the hand, ask them if they want to hit or stay. If they choose hit, we'll give them another value. Then it'll spin back up and print the hand, ask them if they want to hit or stay. If they choose hit, we'll give them another card, blah, 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 blah. And ultimately, it will kick them out of the um, loop as soon as they type something other than hit. That's what this break does. It busts us out of this, this loop. All right. So let's go ahead and run this. This allows it to work, but doesn't do any testing against going over 21 at this point. So there's our current thing. We have a 15. Yeah, we could hit on 15. 19, oh, that's not bad, that's not bad. So, uh, tactically we can do that. <laughs> this is really bad gambling techniques. Okay, but we'll go ahead and say stay, and now we're out of our loop. All right, so that's kind of our final thing. Now, we probably don't want to have them ask if we're hitting or staying if um, we uh, have a value over 21. Right, we want to just get him out of there. Maybe yell that it, it, it's busted and something along those lines. So in here, we can say we can do a couple of uh, choices here. So the presumption is if we are in this loop, if we're at this point, we do not have a busted hand yet. 
it's impossible to have a busted hand after your first cards are dealt, right? You can't have a busted hand from two cards. And so we'll go ahead and give them that choice. And, you know, they can do whatever they want to do um, in that case. But if they chose stay, we'll go ahead and let them exit. But, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and make them stick to typing, typing hit or stay. We'll do something uh, along those lines. So we'll say else if choice is equal to stay. That way if they have a typo, they haven't broken the game. We'll just, they'll just spin back up and let them redo what they just did. All right. So, but we're going to throw another else if in here. Else if the value of the hand currently is greater than 21. We'll go ahead and print busted and then also breakout. That make sense? Okay, so we're asking if they want to hit. We'll let them hit here. Then we're asking, uh, and if they say they want to hit, that's fine. We'll let them do that. But here's the issue with if statements. We cannot get into more than one of these. Now, we potentially busted right here, didn't we? So this question should actually be a child of this guy. The only way our hand changes value inside of this while loop is when we append a new card to it, right? That's the only circumstance in which our hand might change. So after we add something to our hand, let's go ahead and test that hand and say, did you screw up? <laughs> if you screwed up, we're gonna yell busted and then we're gonna kick you out anyways. Okay, you, you, you screwed up. Now. Otherwise, if they chose stay, we'll let them, uh, we'll, we'll break out anyways and do our, here's your final hand, here's its final value. Now, if they typed something other than hit or stay, we're not going to do this. We're not going to do this. We'll just spin back up and effectively redo that last move, right? Your hand hasn't changed, so you're no worse off than you were a second ago because you didn't pick a valid option. All right. Does that make sense why we did the else if choice is equal to stay as opposed to just saying else? Saying else says if you type anything other than hit, we're breaking out. But if we do the else if thing here, we're saying if you pick stay, we'll break out. Otherwise, you messed, you accidentally mistyped, you whatever, and we'll just redo, we'll ask the question again. Nothing, the state of the game has not changed. All right, that makes sense? All right, so now we should have this is not syntax for Python. Python's an elif. Okay. Most programming languages are else, space if, but Whatever. This is an else if in, in in Python. So there's our initial hand. We're gonna go ahead and hit. <coughs> well, it's not a bad hand, but we won't, we've already kind of tested the uh, the other way. So we're gonna we're gonna hit. Ah, we busted. The <laughs> final value of thirty. All right, so it kicked us out. So I think this is a solution to the homework. This looks like it covers everything. All right, so let's go back in here. So any questions about that? What if, and I know in class I've said that if we haven't introduced something in class, you can't use in the homework. Break would be okay if you use it in the homework. What I, I, I'd rather you err on the side of caution, but what I'm usually talking about is like functions that like automatically do stuff for you, like reverse a string when I actually want you to write a function to reverse a string. Don't just call the string's reverse function, you know. So I usually want you to do stuff the mechanical way, but 
break would be okay. You're not going to lose points if you use break on the uh, on on the homework. So I realize there's a certain aspect there where you have to use reasonable judgment, but I don't want you to. If, if something feels like it's too automated and we haven't introduced it in class, I probably don't want you to use it. Because usually I'm asking you questions with the idea that you're not going to be able to solve it in the most you know, uh, efficient way at this point because you don't have enough tools in your toolbox. So I'm asking you to kind of MacGyver it. Is that show still a thing? Actually, they made a comeback, didn't they? Isn't there like a new version of MacGyver? That was like a famous show years and years and years ago with the, you know, the guy would like build an airplane out of like a lawnmower and some duct tape. And like, you know, every single episode, this guy would find himself in like these horrible situations and would just build the impossible to get out of it with, with like nothing. He would defuse bombs with like yarn and a cricket, you know. <laughs> so that's where the MacGyver thing comes from, you know. So he, you got these tools laying next to you. You got to solve a problem in front of you with those tools, whether they're the right tools for the job or not. There was actually an episode of Mythbusters several years ago where they tried to test whether some of the MacGyver uh, solutions would actually work, and almost almost none of them would work. <laughs> I'm pretty sure the lawnmower airplane would have killed people immediately. <laughs> that was not going to, but this dude, I mean, he went for basically a, like an hour and a half flight. I mean, he escaped the state in this airplane. It was pretty solid. <laughs> and this was back in the days where you still had like uh, kids jumping out of windows with like a, uh, a blanket over their back thinking that was a Superman cape. Did you do that when you were kids? My brother and I did that more than once. <laughs> Just idiots. <laughs> In fact, I can remember three distinct times that the neighbors had to call my dad at work to let him know that your kids are on the roof. <laughs> it's just terrible. <laughs> oh, so now we know what's wrong with me. <laughs> All right. Now, let's just assume, in this case, we were not allowed to use break. You could have used it in your homework, it's fine. Okay? But let's just say you had to MacGyver a solution without using break. So now, all of a sudden, we have to have um, a way of guaranteeing that we get into this while loop initially, but also giving us an out, a way of getting out of this while loop. All right? So... You just do some mathy tricks, right? So maybe you do something like curve al is equal to zero. And then you say something like while curve al is less than one, do this stuff. And then instead of break, you set curve al equal to one or equal to 100 or equal to something that's not less than one. And now you're just mathematically, you've built your own break. Make sense? So first time through, curve al is zero, is zero less than one? Yep, we're in. We've, we've gotten into the loop the first time. If we want to get out of the loop, we set curve al equal to something that's one or greater. So the next time through here, curve al is no longer less than one. And now we're out. So give us the same. Uh, so here we'll say hit again. But that used our curve al breakout thing. Man, seven and six. That's I mean that that was that should have been a hit. See, that's why these uh, casinos they just take your money. <coughs> Go ahead. What if he's cheating to yes. shuffle, <laughs> shuffle the deck again and it's like open, uh, like before you get a new card to shuffle the deck again? I don't know about cheating. That's just not how it works. Yeah. But I probably would. I mean, if everything if everything else was right, I probably wouldn't take off for it. That's just I don't not how it works. I didn't do that. Before. Yeah, I mean, it's not cheating. I mean, you're not really giving yourself an advantage other than just being a. <laughs> I mean, the deck was shuffled before, now it's still shuffled. You just reshuffled it. So, I don't know. Um, one thing, though, we need to check is how we wrote our shuffle. Did we write our shuffle based on a hard-coded number or based on the, le uh, the length? We should have done it on the length, but 
or shuffle. Yeah, we did it in life. That's fine. Because, you know, we've removed some cards for that day. <laughs> and we were shuffling it every single time. Yeah, it'll, it'll work. Yeah, it's a, I don't think if you were, not that I don't, I, there's probably not a statistical advantage one way or another, but I would say if you're like one of those, you know, die hard drinking the Kool-Aid gamblers and you were at a, uh, a, a table where they're shuffling between deals, you probably wouldn't play it. You'd think the, that the casino's up to something fishy. But, yeah, it's, it's, it's weird, but it's fine. Because now they have, I think they have games where they're, I mean, effectively doing that, where they're playing off of like six or eight decks to prevent people from counting cards. Um, you know, because counting cards, if you kind of know what's showing on the rest of the table, you can do some statistical analysis of what is uh, potentially in the deck, right? So you know, like, if you were, if if you need a two to win, and you know there's no twos in that deck, you would not be in your best interest to ask for another card. But if you're playing off of eight decks, there, there, there are plenty of twos left, right? So, yeah, it's fine, whatever. Um, okay, other questions on this? So this is a reasonable solution to the, the homework, something in this, this ballpark. All right, so uh, let me, I'll go ahead and give this to you. Um, here, I'll, I'll give you the whole program, but you already have that, but I'll just so you have a complete thing that runs. This is single player blackjack. Something like that. So there you have that code. All right, so now uh, I've already put up a reading assignment for next class. Um, for uh, it's going to be eight. We're skipping ahead in eight a little bit. So we're doing eight, 12, 13, and 14. Um, so introducing dictionaries. I'm going to start talking about them today. Let's go here. So we've mentioned lists. Lists are collections of elements, right? Now, technically, Python does not make lists have all the same type of elements, but it probably makes sense for us to have all the same type of elements inside of a list. Um, so. I think a couple classes ago, I compared lists to what are called arrays in other languages. So like in Java, when you create an array, you say, this is a collection of integers, or this is a collection of strings. It's all going to be the same stuff. From a problem solving perspective in Python, when you use lists, it will likely be a collection of all the same kind of things. But because Python is a loosely typed language and we don't have a way of saying what we're storing in here, you could put whatever you want in there, just you're playing with fire possibly, that type of thing. But a dictionary, and I'm going to go ahead and link this back to an older language as well, is like a struct in languages like C slash C++. And here we'll say, and made a cameo in C Sharp. Java kicked structs out. C Sharp kind of brought them back, but they're not real commonly used anymore. Um, and you'll see why. I mean, I'll just, I'll say it out loud right now, but it'll make sense when we move into objects here uh, next week. But um, when we talked about Java, we mentioned that Java removed structs that we, we did that, right? You know, we talked about like, we went from C to C++ to Java, and we kind of said the Java people made a mistake. You know, they took structs out of the language because their idea was, oh, well, an object that doesn't have methods in it is the same thing as a struct. But it's not actually. And we've recently talked about that, the, the rationale for that. We've talked about pass by value versus pass by reference recently, right? Historically, structs are passed to functions as values. 
objects are passed to functions by reference. So a class, an object that does not have functions in it, which effectively looks like a struct, doesn't behave identically to a struct. Okay. Now, so Java saying if you want structs, just use objects without functions. Let's say 99% of the time, it's probably fine. In fact, 100% of the time, it can be fine, as long as the programmer knows that these guys are passed by uh, reference as opposed to passed by value. But if you're not thinking like that, um, you know, you can get into some trouble if you start making changes to uh, an object inside of a function because those changes will be permanent. Just like recently when we made changes to a list, those changes were permanent changes. Okay, because we were passing in the memory address where that guy lives. And when we made changes to it, we were changing the real deal, not a copy of it. Okay? But now it gets even a little bit more confusing here. So I've said a dictionary is like a struct in some of these old languages, except I said structs are passed by value. That is, a copy is sent rather than the memory address. <coughs> so changes within a function are not permanent. But dictionaries are passed by reference. Now, like I said a few minutes ago, 99% of the time, this wouldn't be a problem for you uh, whether you actually knew how it was being passed or not. But if you had something come into a function and you decided to make changes to that with the expectation that those changes would not be permanent, you would run into problems. If you had a function that took a dictionary in as a parameter and you changed that dictionary and as a programmer you expected those changes not to be permanent, you would be in for a surprise. All right? Because dictionaries are passed by reference. All right. Um, so, what is a dictionary at the end of the day? It is a collection of name value pairs. So it allows us to kind of give some um, a color commentary to the values that we're storing. That makes some sense? All right, so let's look at some examples of these guys. We'll go uh, a little bit video gamey with this. I'll go ahead and leave random up there because we're probably going to use it. I'll dump all that stuff. All right, so why don't we go ahead and write a program like something like a death match where I'll have two players that are going to just beat each other up till somebody dies. Okay, It's very Christian worldview-y. It actually sort of is. I was at Bible study yesterday and Pastor Smith was talking about uh, um, this, this army. There was 120,000 people and they turned on each other and they just killed each other. Like they were getting ready to fight them, and the 120,000 guys they were fighting just, just killed each other. So this, this is all in the Bible. We're good. Okay. <laughs> this, is, this is totally legit. All right. So now dictionaries. So, well, here. Let me just throw it in here. Lists use those brackets like that. Dictionaries use... These curly brace guys. <coughs> so the syntax, so here, I'll, let me just expand this a little bit. This is val1, val2, val3, dot, 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 val in. So that's a list. Comma separated values. Or a dictionary is name value pairs. So this is name one colon val one comma 
comma name to colon val to comma dot 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 name n colon val n. Go ahead. Uh, potentially, yeah. yeah. You could have done mappings from your um, the uh, uh, a king to its value. So fa the face, the, the, maybe like the display value to its numeric value, something like that. You could have done that. Uh, you could have also kept track of like suits. You could have had the ace of hearts. You know, that kind of stuff. <clears throat> okay, so... That's what a dictionary is. I'm just going to also throw a, one little word out here just for us to keep in the back of our head. We'll come back and talk about it at some point. JSON. Many of you have heard that phrase before. JSON. Okay, so this is JavaScript object notation. 99.9% .9 of our modern uh, APIs use JSON for communication. So what we're learning here about dictionaries it's pretty much how data is sent over the internet um, when we want to send object information between two points. That'll become a lot clearer later on, but this um, dictionary format isn't by accident, is the, the, the punchline. It's very much organized in a way that is usable for a lot of things. All right, so, um, so we're going to say that a, uh, a player... So if we kind of go video gamey on it, a player has like a number of hit points, right? So we have hit points. Um, so this is like, um, you know, they're, how close are they to death? Um, maybe they have a attack power. We're going to keep this fairly simple at first. All right. So this is how hard do they hit? Something like that. Okay, and then maybe they also have a defense. How hard are they to hit? So we want to represent this idea of a player, um, and we want to have some information in there about that player um, so that we can have two different players and we're going to have them fight each other uh, probably next class, but we'll at least start this up right now. All right. So we're going to say player one. Now, we can add things to a dictionary. I'll just go to, uh, here's dictionary methods. Uh, actually, we can just add it directly. We don't append to a dictionary. That's fine. So we're going to say player one is going to start off as the empty dictionary. There's nothing in here. And we're going to go ahead and give them some hit points. So we'll say player one at bucket hit points. So not bucket zero, not bucket one, at bucket hit points. So we're saying it's name. So we're name value pair. So hit points is going to be equal to, um, what was our, our rand int thing? Slack real quick. I'll just grab the. Can I use randint in here for shuffle? Yeah, randint zero two. All right, so we're gonna go ahead. And we're gonna say so. We'll say randint, and let's say the minimum number of hit points is ten. And the maximum number is forty. Something like that. We'll give that guy some random number of hit points. And then we'll say player one at uh, um, bucket. What else did we say these guys have? Uh, attack power. Um, so let's say it's two to five. So either wimpy hitters or hard hitters. So this is attack power. This will be a rand int. Two to five, and then player one, defense, or a lot of, like in Dungeons and Dragons, it's called armor class, AC, but whatever. And defense is with a S, right? 
And we'll say rand int. I don't know, we'll have to decide how we're going to use uh, defense. Let's do 5, 10. Something like that. All right, so that's player one. We can go ahead and say print player one. And there is our collection of name value pairs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah this is a tank. <laughs> so if you don't play video games, tanks are the meat shields <laughs> that stand in front of the boss that's swinging real hard and they don't do very much damage. They just survive. Right? So this guy has a lot of hit points, a lot of defense, and is basically hitting for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you really should just dual wield shields. I'm surprised they don't have that in one of some of these games. Like, why doesn't World of Warcraft have dual wielding shields for tanks? That would be awesome. Like, look, I can't hit hard anyway. Because <laughs> they have all these abilities for taunting, right? To kind of keep the keep the boss on them. So they're not doing. They're not building up threat by hitting them for five hit points. Yeah, you just have two shields. You just keep like taunting them. Just and you do shield bash, which, oh, great idea, patent that. <laughs> Even D&D &D doesn't have that. They've tried all sorts of crazy stuff. If you've played uh, tabletop uh, role-playing stuff, even the latest version doesn't have it. None of the versions of D&D &D have had, they have monkey grip to dual-wield uh, two-handed weapons, but they don't have uh, the ability to dual-wield shields. I'm missing an opportunity there. All right, so we see here that we have a, um, a, a collection of name value pairs. We're keeping track of some different attributes of something. All right, so for next class, do the reading assignment, get caught up on dictionaries, and then we'll come back, we'll create another player, and they're gonna have these guys fight to the death, okay? And then we're gonna talk about the weakness of that solution and how we can upgrade to object-oriented programming where we can bring a lot of those details into the object rather than have the dictionary live here and then a bunch of functions that operate on dictionaries live somewhere else. Okay? Questions, comments, concerns, bribes. I will see everybody on Friday.